Hello, this is Matthew Erich with the Canadian Patriot Review. I'm just making this little video introduction um, as an opener to two videos that you are going to watch, which take place in the question and answer period after a conference that had occurred, a town hall meeting, I should say, here in Montreal, featuring Maxime Bernier, the head of the People's Party of Canada, his colleague, uh, Adrienne uh, Pouliot, and um, their responses to questions that were posed by myself and by my colleague, uh, David Goslin, who's a contributor for the Canadian Patriot Review. My uh, point uh, of making this short video uh, to set a bit of context is one to just get across that while my question was posed in English, uh, David Goslin's question was posed in French. And though I don't, I would love to, I don't have the ability to do the translations as we speak. So uh, unless you know French, um, the second question is going to be difficult to follow, but I'll try to just maybe give a, a thumbnail sketch. Maxime Bernier is somebody who is who stands out in the political class. He's for his uh, consistent stance against the mandates, the dictatorial mandates that we have seen imposed uh, around the last two years of COVID protocols. He is somebody who was, cre was once a cabinet member of the Harper government and has created a very interesting political movement of mostly grassroots across Canada uh, over the recent years, which has consistently stood up uh, against the push for technocracy, world government, and uh, and much else. So while many of the those things that he resists and doesn't like are very good, I think that what was useful in us asking the questions that we did and hearing the answers that he gave um, was that it got across a point, a psychological point of crisis, which contaminates many conservative oriented um, politicians and citizens alike in the Western uh, rules based order, which deals with the idea that with the oncoming economic cl collapse, which was the feature of my question, which is that we are going to f face very soon um, a controlled demolition, a disintegration of the banking system, which is going to wreak havoc on many lives. Faced with that, what is their positive view of what can be done utilizing the powers of the sovereign nation state as a system to defend people and the real economy from said collapse? What my, um, my friend uh, David uh, introduced was then a follow-up question on the issue of a vision. What is the role, if any, of government in applying a vision for the long-term needs of society, knowing that the old adage, where there is no vision of people perish, is likely true today as it was 2,000 years ago. He gave a few examples of times in Quebec and Canada's past when we did have a vision, when in the 1950s and the 60s we were building mega infrastructure, great projects we were investing in scientific and, and uh, technological progress. That is something which is merely a faint memory nowadays. This has been now 50 years, 60 years of neoliberal myopia, um, consumerism and money chasing that we have forgotten how to actually think about a viable capital industrial society. And then he gave some examples as well of where this type of practice is currently being um, engaged in today with a focus on China's capacity to build large-scale infrastructure, high-speed rail, and what have you. The responses, unfortunately, on both counts were more than a little disappointing, not surprising, but the idea of free market, uh, self-regulating marketplaces is a complete fiction. It, there's no example in history where the magical, invisible hand of self-organizing marketplaces ever brought about large-scale growth of industries, infrastructure, or progress. It always happened, this process, in conjunction with moral leaders utilizing political power to achieve certain orientations that made it profitable to do things that were also good for society while also being profitable for entrepreneurs and individuals. It doesn't have to be one or the other. That's what history teaches us from uh, deep, deep history through the Renaissance, the American Revolution, the, the 19th century and into our present age. The, um, the idea that controlled disintegration is somehow um, something which needs to happen, that chaos needs to happen in order for uh, an emergent new system of competitive currencies, alternative currencies, Bitcoin, cryptos, gold-backed currencies that will somehow just mystically arise after a, a period of, of 
destruction and pain, which was sort of what Maxime Bernier was inferring, is uh, a very destructive and unfortunate answer. That is, sometimes indeed we have examples where some creation did follow destruction, but more often than not, what we find is destruction follows destruction. And fascism, if anything, is the solution that is brought about after the period of chaos and destruction is imposed. So um, the use of the Bank of Canada as an instrument for growth, the use of things like Glass-Steagall to defend humanity and the real economy from the oncoming speculative bubbles that will be soon ripping to shreds, uh, what little remains of our viable economy. These are all things which are absolutely scientifically needed going into the coming storm. And unfortunately, the ideological commitment to laissez-faire um, a laissez-faire version of capitalism, which was not just something shared by Maxime Bernier and his colleague, but also by the Conservative Party leadership today of people like Pierre Poilievre, who, you know, also speaks very well when it comes to pointing out the dicta dictatorship of the Great Reset, the, uh, the World Health Organization's abuses of liberties and other things that deal with uh, dictatorship and world government. Those are all fine. But when it comes to the question of, well, what would be your view of what could be done instead as a positive process, it really is hands off. Just let, let things go as they will, which I'm sorry. In my view, at this point in time, when you have a highly centralized, deep state structure that is supranational, highly powerful, without utilizing the instruments which we have at our disposal, like the sovereign nation state and its power to break up banks, to defend people, to emit credit through national banks, the way China does through its state banks for large-scale infrastructure and development. If you don't use those natural instruments in, in defense of people while you're at war, then it is incompetent and borderline criminally so. I still support overall, in my assessment, Maxime Bernier as being somebody who has the power to learn. Um, I'm not abrogating, I'm not giving up my, uh, my tendency to um, support the policy, but it, or the, the party, the People's Party of Canada, but it does need to be understood. We, we can't just accept things and promote things ideologically without being critical at all, because we're just so desperate and looking for a hero. Um, we have to find that way in ourselves, and we have to be openly honest when we see a point of criticism, even in people who are, are our allies. So it is with that in mind that I'm going to end this little introduction. Um, I hope you find the questions and the answers uh, interesting. And if you are a member of either the Conservative Party or the People's uh, Party of Canada, or if you're maybe a repentant, repentant liberal or NDP who's just realized that your, your parties are under the control of a foreign agency that seeks no uh, good for your nation, your people, your society, your, your family, the, and you're thinking about what do we do as an, as an alternative, then um, consider very seriously studying, going to the Canadian Patriot website, canadianpatriot.org. There's a lot of material on the history of Glass-Steagall as well as its effect in Canada, the fight over national banking, especially the use of the Bank of Canada, as well as the fraudulent Federal Reserve System in the US and what has been done in opposition to that. How did Roosevelt uh, create a national banking situation without having a national bank um, while doing combat with the Wall Street and City of London financiers in the 1930s? How did JFK revive this way of thinking? How was this done previously by Lincoln with the greenbacks or um, by Hamilton, who uh, established a system of national banking that, would, that had permitted the USA to not only survive its tumultuous first years of existence as an economic underdeveloped basket case, but then to also prosper to the point that the population quadrupled within a very short period of time, as well as increased longevity, life expectancy, per capita productivity, and overall cultural power within decades. It was quite astounding. So this is all material that I think any type of activist uh, citizenry should have under their belt when they're going into an actions in their current age, which is beleaguered by a lot of uh, storms. A lot of these problems are being caused by our own misunderstanding of our own history, our own ignorance that has been uh, induced by those controlling our history textbooks. And um, if you want to, again, know more information, you can write to me at Canadian Patriot 1776 at tutanota.com, where um, you could request some of the PDF books 
on the untold history of Canada, as well as the Clash of the Two Americas that goes through this. You could also buy those if you want to support the work online uh, on the same website. So with that, watch the videos. Take care. Merci beaucoup uh, pour toutes les présentations. And uh, I'm going to pose my question in English. Thank you. And you could answer in French, si vous voulez. Um, I really appreciated introducing Bertrand Russell, by the way. Uh, oh, I think nice. that historical context is often missing in a lot of these discussions. Um, myself, I'm uh, Matthew Erd. I'm a, an editor for the Canadian Patriot magazine. And uh, my question has a little bit to bear on a specific issue of the economic crisis, specifically the economic collapse which I think many people see coming on quicker and quicker, um, and also something a bit more general on the question of power and government. Because faced with the oncoming, I mean, people say, well, what's the cause of the oncoming collapse? Is it the sp supply chains? Is it the infinite money printing? And it's kind of, these are certainly making it worse, no doubt. But Mervyn King, the, the former governor of the Bank of England, was even saying in September of 2019 that we were on the verge of a financial Armageddon. And many people have been discussing the growth of derivatives, which now outnumber global GDP by a factor of 20 on, on some estimates. Worse so it, than 2008, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, yeah, they, it's, it's a, a big loophole, right, Dodd-Frank and everything else. So we've seen now that the speculative activities that have contaminated the real economy are, are they outweigh anything that has to do with supporting life by a fact, by magnitudes. So with this oncoming tsunami heading towards us with this time bomb that used to be an economy, but now I see it as a time bomb, of a bubble on bubbles upon bubbles with unpayable debts that are waiting to default. It's not just the default of the debt, it's all of the derivatives built on the debt that's going to disappear. So it seems to me that we need consorted action of some sort that utilizes the power of the sovereign nation state. And I know back when I look at history, Canada used, to, you used to go to jail back in the fifties or sixties for trying to gamble with people's savings. Like we had four pillars of banking, you know, you couldn't take people's savings and gamble in the speculative markets. You couldn't take insurance and, and do everything was, was contained, right? Today, it's, it's all under one roof with universal banking. So there are certain things like the idea of restoring the four pillars or in, in America, it used to be the, the Glass-Steagall initiative, the, the separation of banking. Would something like that be antithetical to your outlook of a sort of laissez-faire, hands-off uh, approach to economy? Or do you think that this would be something viable to, to defend the people, the real economy from the oncoming collapse and let the bankers take their own losses when that time, time comes. So. Yeah. Yes, thanks for asking. Uh, actually, you're right. The collapse, a recession, a depression. You know the difference between a recession and a depression. A recession is when your neighbors lost their jobs. A depression is when you are losing your job. So that's, I think we're going to be in a depression uh, with inflation also. We call that stagflation. That can happen, but I don't, you know, I, don't, I cannot forecast the future. But with everything that you said in the beginning, bubbles everywhere, that can happen. What can we do to protect ourselves? Uh, I believe it's to, and, you know, I'm not a financial advisor, but to invest in real asset. Uh, that will be the most important right now. Uh, look today, the stock markets today went down and that's the beginning and I believe that it will go down. So what about the bankers, the big bankers and the central bankers? What we must do, we must have more competition. Competition is good. We must have competition in money also. Right now we have a fiat money uh, everywhere, paper money. It's a, a, a monopole that the Bank of Canada and the Fed, they have. And I think with the electronic money, Bitcoin and other money, or I don't know, that can be, that can be uh, more competition. So like that, if you have more competitions, the big bankers will be less powerful. And I think that's important to do that. What we must do also, we must fight the central bank digital money. If that happen, that will be like a credit system. The central bank will be able to know everything that you're doing. You're spending too much there. You won't have your money. They can control everything. So we must stop that. But the recession will happen. We cannot stop that. It's because of the mistake of the past from our politicians and our uh, central bankers. I believe that today we must just work harder and be sure to protect our asset 
and try to find a new system. And I believe that the best one when we had always prosperity and bankers and politicians uh, were not able to play with our future was when we had in the 19th century a kind of a gold standard and that was real money. Now we have fiat money and you, when you have inflation also, the first one that are profiting that are profiting from that from the inflation is the rich because if you have asset in the stock markets if you have there your assets will go up that will be first and after that you'll have the price inflation that we are having like that so inflation is a regression a regressive tax it's hurt most the most vulnerable because you cannot you know you spend your money for your day to day for your grocery and so that's why we must fight inflation. And for the future, our policy is to have a zero inflation target with the bank. But my answer is the storm will come. We need to be ready. We need to work together. We need to be sure to have strong asset. And, um, and I believe that the cooperation between people, the real solidarity will emerge. When you have a difficult time, your neighbors and your, 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 your parents and your family, must be together and to help you during that tough time. But I want to give you some hope on the future, the economic future, but it would be a tough time, like you said. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, premièrement, je te remercie pour ton courage. Right? Tu se fais arrêter partout uh, dans le pays, c'est bien. Um, dans le fond, um, il y a un proverbe uh, « Where there is no vision, the people perish » où s'il n'y a pas de vision, les gens y périssent. Et uh, je parlais avec mon ami Mathieu, on parlait de l'entrevue que Pierre y a fait avec uh, Jordan Peterson. Puis um, il mentionnait, uh, Jordan Peterson, il a dit « C'est qu'est-ce qui, qu -ce qui distingue des autres ?» Puis sa réponse, c'était super uh, vague, c'était uh, « I speak clearly », c'est-à-dire « Je suis direct » ou quoi que ce soit. Dans ma tête, l'idée, c'est quoi la vision? Tire, je, euh, je pensais, dans le temps de Daniel Johnson, okay, on, on, le Québec, on bâtissait des grands barrages, il y avait plein de grands projets, tire, dans le temps de Kennedy. Et quand on regarde la Chine, tire, on peut dire plein de choses sont mauvais, bla, 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 mais ils ont quand même le contrôle de leur économie d'une façon, ils ont une banque centrale qui n'appartient pas à des banquiers privés. Fait qu'ils ont les mécanismes de crédit pour diriger le crédit envers les, les choses qu'ils ont besoin. Fait qu'ils ont bâti genre 40 000 km de chemins de fer d'eau de vitesse. Sont où nos chemins de fer d'eau de vitesse? Sont où nos centrales d'énergie nucléaire quatrième génération? Sont où nos grands projets de fusion, juste comme dans les projets, le projet Apollo, right, d'exploration d'espace? Ils ont dit pour chaque dollar investi dans ce projet, il y avait un retour de 14 pourquoi? Est-ce que c'était l'inflation? Le gouvernement, il dépensait de l'argent? Ben non, parce que toute la technologie, toutes le, les manufactures que ça a créé, ça a engendré euh, une, une différente dynamique qui a permis la création de la vraie richesse tu sais, et, et d'un futur, des nouvelles infrastructures. Fait que ma question, c'est quoi, quand je pense à Pierre, puis qu'est-ce que j'entends, euh, c'est quoi la vision? Sont où les grands projets? Et il me semble que ce serait la façon simple de, de présenter aux gens dire, un avenir qui peuvent dire Ouais, je soutiens ça. Ça serait simple, il me semble. Écoute, euh, <rire> c est, c est, c est, on, on a une approche qui est difficile à peut-être expliquer. C'est bien plus facile. Pour François Legault, par exemple, au provincial, de dire « je vais donner 6 milliards de dollars à Investissement Québec, puis 12 milliards de dollars à Pierre Fitzgibbons, le ministre de l'Économie, puis lui, il va faire des projets. Il va en faire, puis il va faire des projets verts, puis le lithium, puis le cobalt, puis il va faire ci, il va faire ça, puis ça n'ira plus. Et euh, il y en a, a peut-être qui vont voir le jour. Mais ce n'est pas ça la solution, parce que ce 12 milliards de dollars que Fitzgibbons va dépenser ou que Guy Leblanc Investissement Québec va, va dépenser, 
il est pris de vos poches. Donc, peut-être que si tu avais 300 dollars de plus dans tes poches que tu n'as pas payé en impôts, c'est sûr que tu ne construirais pas là, euh, un barrage hydroélectrique, mais tu le réinvestirais dans l'économie à ta façon, de la façon probablement la plus efficace et productive possible. Puis ça, paraît, ça paraîtrait peut-être pas, mais multiplie 300 dollars par 8 millions de Québécois, ça aurait beaucoup d'impact. Alors, c'est... C'est sûr que quand tu regardes la Chine, les grands projets, c'est fantastique, mais, mais ça cache une réalité à l'effet que si cet argent-là était laissé entre les mains du monde euh, et, 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 et que tu avais des consommateurs libres euh, et que tu avais un système de concurrence et euh, de capitalisme, tu aurais la construction de projets aussi, mais ça serait beaucoup plus efficace. C'est facile aujourd'hui, je prends les exemples provinciaux, je suis désolé, là, mais François Legault qui nous dit « je vais construire des maisons pour aînés », puis c'est un beau projet, hein, on est tous pour les, pour les aînés, les pauvres autres, il y en a 5 000 qu'on a perdus, mais ça coûte, une maison pour aînés, ça coûte 800 000 par place, pas par maison, par, par chambre, 800 000 par chambre, t'sais, alors qu'un privé va le faire pour 300 000 là. Alors, tu as 500 000 là, jetés aux poubelles gaspillées qu'on aurait pu utiliser pour créer la richesse autrement. Alors, moi, je pense que ce n'est pas la, la, la solution, l'intervention gouvernementale, pas plus que la, la, la réponse tantôt là, de, de voir le Glass-Steagall Act revenir dans le portrait. Ce n'est pas ça la solution. C'est, on n'est pas contre la réglementation, là, mais, mais c'est de laisser le marché le plus possible euh, décider des priorités selon les, 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 les besoins puis les souhaits des consommateurs à un prix qui est compétitif. Puis euh, c'est comme ça que, que tu vas créer la richesse. C'est peut-être pas aussi flasheux. Tu ne sais, peux pas couper de ruban. Hein, c'est plate, hein, parce que le go, là, quand il va, quand tu finis par ouvrir le premier, euh, la première maison pour aînés, là, puis Marguerite Blais, tout le monde va être là, là la, la Kyrielle, là, ils vont tous être là pour couper le ruban, la photo. Alors que si ça avait été laissé au privé, ouais, tu sais, il ne serait même pas, mais ça, il n'y aurait eu pareil, là, mais ça aurait été dans le privé. Alors, c'est difficile pour quelqu'un comme Maxime de dire « je ne prendrai pas le crédit, je n'irai pas pour la photo puis je vais laisser tout le monde marcher aller ». Mais on sait que c'est la meilleure solution. Ben, je, je veux juste faire une anecdote là-dessus, c'est beau Adrien. Euh, J'ai été ministre de l'Industrie. Mon rôle, c'était de donner des subventions aux grandes entreprises. Bombardier, toutes les grandes entreprises. Moi, je ne crois pas aux subventions aux entreprises. Prendre votre argent, si l'entreprise a besoin d'une subvention, c'est parce qu'elle n'est pas efficace, c'est parce qu'elle n'est pas profitable, c'est parce qu'elle ne répond pas aux besoins du consommateur. Pourquoi taxer les petits entrepreneurs qui, eux, n'ont pas de lobbyistes à Ottawa pour avoir des subventions et prendre cet argent-là et donner ça aux grandes entreprises? Donc, ça allait contre mes valeurs. Et ce que j'ai essayé de faire, j'ai parlé au premier ministre. J'ai dit, on devrait abolir les subventions aux entreprises. Le, et comme ça, bien, ça serait parfait. Je serais ministre d'Industrie, mais m'occuper de la réglementation de l'industrie et non pas de, la sub, de subventionner les industries. Et je peux dire que M. Euh, m'a bien répondu. Il m'a dit, Maxime, ça ne faisait pas partie de notre programme électoral. On n'a pas eu un mandat là-dessus. Donc, euh, non, ton rôle, c'est de continuer à faire ça. Et là, j'avais un dilemme. Et couper les rubans, comme dit Adrien, pour un politicien, c'est populaire. Tu passes à la TV, puis tu coupes le ruban, puis après ça, tu t'en vas dans ton comté, puis le monde te dit « Hey, t'étais donc bien beau à TV hier, c'est le fun, je t'ai vu. » Moi, je ne voulais pas avoir cette réputation-là de donneur de subvention. Donc, ce que j'ai fait, je donnais des cadeaux à place des cadeaux politiques à mes collègues ministres. Je leur disais, il y a une grosse subvention là, que mon ministère va donner à Bombardier. Veux-tu aller l'annoncer? Veux-tu aller couper le ruban? Et qui était content. Fait qu'il s'en allait, il coupait le ruban, puis il donnait la subvention au nom du ministère de l'Industrie. Donc, c'est la façon dont j'ai essayé de gérer, mais j'ai fait beaucoup de déréglementation. Et donc, c'est ça, là. Les subventions aux grandes entreprises, c'est injuste, c'est disque. C'est discriminatoire parce que les petites entreprises n'en auront jamais. Et il faut avoir une, une équité. Et c'est pour ça que nous, au parti, on dit non aux subventions aux entreprises et qu'on soit équitable envers tous les entrepreneurs.
Moi, je veux revenir sur... Euh, parce que, bon, la question, c'est sur le, le, la vision. Hein, c'est quoi? Les, les, est-ce qu'on a une vision pour... Et ça, ça m'interpelle beaucoup ce que tu disais sur euh, les chemins de fer euh, et la Chine. Parce que moi, j'ai habité en Chine pendant cinq ans et ils ont un réseau ferroviaire vraiment extraordinaire. J'ai voyagé là, comme je n'ai jamais voyagé dans ma vie et je me suis toujours posé la question, mais pourquoi au Québec, pourquoi au Canada, on n'a pas un réseau ferroviaire comme ça? Parce que, je ne sais pas, moi je me dis, au Québec, je veux dire, prendre l'avion à Bécomo, cette île, c'est genre 800 piastres, euh, puis en auto, ça prend une journée. Hein, une grosse journée. Euh, est-ce que ce ne serait pas un moyen de vitaliser le Québec, justement, d'avoir un réseau ferroviaire? Les gens voyageraient peut-être un peu plus. Ça, ça vitaliserait peut-être le, le, le tourisme. Euh, euh, oui, je ne sais pas. Des, des trains électriques, en plus, en Chine. Là. Donc, euh, oui, moi, je, je, je suis d'accord avec toi. On a besoin de, de, de projets de vision. Mais moi, je ne suis pas une politicienne. Donc, euh, <rire> j'ai pas, j'ai, je pense à demain seulement. 